first of all, let's look at why we have too many personas. And quite often it's because we look at a persona as a title. And a persona is not a title, it's a role. Welcome to Agents of Change, a podcast about the future of B2B marketing, featuring insights from executives at top agencies. I'm Danielle O'Neill with Leadtail. Let's hop on in. Hi, welcome back to Agents of Change. I am excited to have with me today, Ardeth Albi. She is the CEO of Marketing Interactions. Um, she is an author. She has a lot of experience, a very varied background that has helped her actually with this business where she is a B2B marketing strategist. Uh, she is working and helping identify and building those personas for her clients, as well as helping them create content that's relevant for their buyers. So we're excited to have you here today, Ardeth and talk about personas. Let's talk about content. Let's get into all of the things that we need to get in front of the faces of our audiences today. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks so much for asking. Absolutely. So Ardeth, one of the things that I was excited about when we first met um, was just hearing you talk about the personas and and really our audiences and who it is. So I wanted to kind of start with a bang. Um, in our discussion, you'd actually given us a stat that almost kind of floored me a little, that 43% of B2B marketers can't identify the audience that they should be targeting. So first, that's a little bit frightening, but honestly, not that surprising, which is kind of the most surprising part. So I want to dive into that stat a little bit more if we could. Yeah, um, I'm trying to remember which report it came out of. I want to say it's a Content Marketing Institute um, research study. But um, what I see a lot is that we kind of have an idea. You know, and then a lot of times we are going by who's in our database, whether or not that's the right target market or not. Right. Because sometimes we attract people that shouldn't be in there. But the other thing is also that we get stuck on titles and who we think we need to target. Like the sales team will say we need C level, but really who marketers can engage and interact with or director level who then build up to a C-level audience type of thing. So we're thinking about it from the aspect of who we ultimately need sometimes at the detriment of who we can actually engage, who will get our ideas into those conversations and then move it up the chain. So, you know, sometimes that's the issue. Um, most of the time it's because we haven't done the work to really research. How does this all work? And who gets involved when and, you know, who needs to know what? And so we kind of guess. And that doesn't tend to work out really well sometimes. Yes, that guessing game. And I, I know that everybody kind of gets caught in that and it tends to be, well, we know that our audience is C-suite this and this and this, but they tend to be wrong on that a lot. Um, and that comes down to those personas that you were talking about and the fact that one, we have too many and two, they're probably not right. So I want to talk about that first one, the fact that some of us have too many personas. Why is that an issue? Well, first of all, let's look at why we have too many personas. And quite often it's because we look at a persona as a title and a persona is not a title, it's a role. So quite often when I'm building personas, a single persona could apply to 15 or 20 titles, depending on, you know, how companies are structured and who has the responsibility for what and, you know, what industry they're in. Sometimes their titles are different, right? But they're doing the same thing. And so we tend to, you know, think we need to make a persona for every single title. Well, first of all, that it, it doesn't work because what happens is, do you have the resource to create an end-to-end -end story for every single persona you want to build. And so that's the problem. So if you have six personas and you have a resource to build story for three, what happens to the other three? You know, and I even tell clients, if you don't have the resource to address them, don't build them because they'll be obsolete by the time you do have the resource. 
So create them at the time you can use them, right? Because then your insights are fresh and clean and applicable to what's going on today in the market rather than, yeah, we talked to our customers six months ago and this is what they said. Well, in today's environment, whatever they said six months ago may not be anything like what they're doing today. Yeah, it doesn't matter anymore. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, and I I'd want to call out that your little specific soundbite here that I think everybody, let's all focus on this for a second. Personas are roles, not titles, because mm-hmm. we all tend to get very focused on that title. I'm looking for VP of this specifically instead of focusing on that role. So I really want to hone in on that key point that you just made. Right. And, and, you know, most times I work with enterprise companies that have the capacity to say, okay, we're going to focus on this ICP, which happens to be an enterprise company in this vertical for this product. Some companies don't have that latitude. And so the reason the role thing is so important, think about it, uh, an SMB who has a VP of whatever, where in an enterprise company, that same role might be a director role. You know what I'm saying? Because the hierarchies are different. Specializations are different. How the roles get divided out is different. And that's why it's really key to focus on that role versus title thing. Yep. Yep. I love that. Love that. And so I think that's going to be one of the main key takeaways from this conversation, I hope. (laughs) I know it will be for me. Um, So personas are crap. That was something that you had mentioned (laughs) in an earlier conversation. And that was something that has kind of stuck out in my mind. Let's talk about that. Let's dig into a little bit more. Personas are crap. Why do you say that? Well, the first reason I say it is because over the years, I've probably built, I don't know, 500, 600 personas. And every time a client comes to me, they say, well, you know what? We already have personas. So we just want to start to get right into the content strategy, right? Let's get into getting stuff out the door. And I'm like, great, send over the personas. In all of those projects, I have had one set of personas where I said, we could work with this. So the reason I say personas are crap is because they are. But it's because I've even seen personas that were sent over to me um, by a client where they were obviously built from a template. And the reason you could tell is because they didn't replace all the template prompt text, right? Um, but the, the real reason I say it is because they're too high level. So you get these, they try to cram everything on one slide, you know, to make it compact. And so what you end up is with goals like this person wants to increase revenue. Great. How, what are, what, how are they going to do that? You know, and, and what are they responsible for that would cause that, you know, those kinds of things. And you need those deep insights. But then I see, Personas that say, you know, Sally is 42 and lives in the suburbs and has two kids and a dog and drives a Volvo. Really? What are you going to do with that in B2B marketing? What do you do with that? Nothing. Therefore, it's useless information taking up space. And we get caught up in that, you know, and then they'll say, you know, salary range or whatever. Why do you care? This makes no difference at all. And so what you want to look at instead are their professional attributes, like how long have they been in their career? You know, do they, are are they leaving a legacy or are they climbing the ladder still? You know, do, can you tell if they are more concerned about their team being successful or if they're more ego driven, like make me successful, right? Um, You know, so there's all kinds of things you can look at to help understand the people that tend to inhabit the role. And so, for example, I use a tool called Crystal Nose to get a read on personality types. And what I found, I'll ask my clients, give me a download of, you know, 50 names and and titles, what have you, um, that are in your database that are representative of this persona. And I'll go out and Crystal Nose and look them up and find out what their archetype is for a persona. What I've learned, and I've been using this tool for several years now, and what I've learned is that people in a particular role tend to be the same personality type because they're just kind of built for that role, I guess, you know, so, so they'll, they'll fall within a range of archetypes that are right next to each other. And so a lot of those attributes will be similar. 
but that informs your tone and style and the voice you use and how you, you know, present the point of view of the content and whatever to engage with those people. That's way more useful than two dogs and three kids and a Volvo. You know what I'm saying? So we just need to do the work. But the other thing, the reason that I say personas are crap is because they're made up. We get our team and a couple of pizzas and we sit in the conference room and we say, our persona is so-and-so and they like this and like that and whatever. And what it ends up being is, you know, a collection of insights about what all of you guys think, you know, what the team thinks, not who these people are, what they're actually going through. And so, and I know I have clients that say we're not allowed to talk to our customers, you know, sales won't let us talk to them or customer success won't or whatever. They need to get over themselves, in my opinion. Quite often, they will let somebody like me talk to them because I'm a consultant and what have you. And so they'll let me talk to them. But, you know, it's it's um, interesting or they or they just say we don't have time. We don't have time and take, you know, three to three to four months to build these personas. and We need to get a campaign out the door next week. So let's snap to it, you know, <laughs> and, but it's like, OK, how how long do you want to keep doing something that isn't going to produce the right results? What's the difference if you take the time to get it right? And yes, you can do a lot of research um, and there are internal resources you can use, like recorded sales calls and win loss reports and talking to your salespeople and whatever. But there is no substitute for talking to your customers. And usually when I'm doing a persona project, I have the team that I'm working with sit in on the calls and I, you, they're supposed to be muted. Well, one day one of them was not and something a customer said made her gasp because she had no idea that that was actually a thing with their customers. Right. So every time I've done this, there are insights that people go really. And I'm like, yeah, and not just one person said it. Like five people said the same exact thing. And, you know, because you're looking for commonalities. Right. What's what's true across the widest swath. And, you know, but you can't find that out without talking to people. You just can't, you know, and you also don't know what words do they use. We get caught up in the jargon we use about our, our products and, you know, that kind of thing. Our customers don't talk that way, you know. So what words are they using? How do they define their problem? Is it the same way we're defining it? You know, how do they define the outcome or the value that they want on the other side that makes a difference to them given what they're responsible for? Are we defining that properly? And are we talking about it in the right way? So, you know, there's a lot of things. Do we actually know who else they have to convince, you know, to get buy-in and what that pushback might be? And it's fascinating to hear them talk about it. Well, Tim over in IT said, blah, blah, blah. And he wasn't happy until then and then we had to go find this other thing. And, you know, and they go through the whole thing. And it's it's interesting to hear the different things that pop up. And sometimes the things that we think are obstacles are not actually there. You know, so but there's no way to find out unless you take the time and make the effort to talk to them. Or to your point, they may have been obstacles two years ago. Mm -hmm. that are no longer valid based in today's market. Right, exactly. So that kind of leads into this next point. I know that, you know, you've kind of developed your own strategy for this. Um, and you've used your strategy to develop these personas to create your content marketing strategy. Mm -hmm. So what does that look like once you know and you've gone through your phases of who are we actually wanting to market to, who are we actually wanting to talk to, then where do we go from there with that content side of it? Right. Well, one of the things that I discovered mostly through fiction writing when I was studying fiction and working on novel well, writing. Really, and things. I absolutely love that we're able to pull like your history of being a fiction writer into how we can use them <laughs> B2B marketing. It's brilliant. And I'm fascinated uh, by it. And it's just so fun. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting what you learn from different things that are actually applicable in other places. But what I really learned was um, because I studied dialogue right, a lot, because in fiction, you're writing dialogue between characters. Right. And so what came to me and what I really learned was a conversation is actually a series of Q&A. And so just like you're asking me questions and I'm answering you. If you walk up to somebody in the hallway and say, hey, Chuck, how's it going? Did you hear about X? He's going to say, 
uh, no, tell me what happened, you know? And you say, well, blah, 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 blah. And he says, really? Well, does so-and-so know? And so if you listen to that exchange back and forth, it's Q&A, right? I'm giving you information, then asking a question, and then you're responding, and then asking me a question, and then, and so it goes. So one of the things that I built into the personas that I build is, what are all the questions that they have along the way? What is all the stuff they need to get answered? What do they need to know, you know, to perform their due diligence, to learn enough about the product, to be able to convince everybody else to get on board, whatever. And so I create this series of questions and I ask a lot of um, questions in the interviews to uncover all this stuff. And so I create the series of questions in a persona and how you decide to answer those questions pretty much gives you the storyline from beginning to end. Now, new questions can always pop up, right? But then you look and say, okay, that question wouldn't happen here, but it would happen more about here. And you get an answer for it and insert the content into it. And you've got an updated storyline, right? So I have clients who have these storylines in play for three or four years before they have to, you know, take them down and redo them because some big, big thing has happened in the market, right? To shift everything. And now the questions are different, but it, we just would go out and update them once a year, right? And make sure that, you know, we tweaked and tuned them and, you know, optimize them or updated statistics that we used or whatever. But you once you've developed this storyline that answers these questions all the way through, you've got not only a full program, but you're creating momentum because of the way Q&A works. You know, you say, well, what about this? And then they get content that explains all that. And they say, oh, that's really great. But wait, now what about this other thing? Oh, hey, by the way, we have this too. You know, and so if you really understand how that process builds, <coughs> excuse me, your persona has a built-in storyline that you can now execute against to create not a random piece of content or a stop a campaign that, you know, only serves for a short period of time, but you've got the full story for what does it take to get them from what's going on when that status quo changes for them to say, whoa, wait a minute, maybe I need to do something about this to them working all the way through it and deciding to do that. And that's one of the most valuable things. I think if your persona does not give you the storyline, at least to start with, right? So you get a really good understanding of what's going on. And then as you learn more about it, whatever, like I said, you can insert other pieces or you say, oh, this must not have been the right question. Let's take this one out, change it with this one. But you've got that whole framework to work with and you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time you go to launch something in market. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I'm actually really excited for our writers to hear this episode because I feel like they're going to be like, hallelujah, this is what we've been saying. <laughs> they're going to be 100% behind you. Um, funnily enough, Allie, who oversees our team of writers, she actually started script writing. And so mm -hmm. that that's how she came to love. And she took that same sort of, and it's funny to hear you talk about taking that conversation because she uses that same idea when it comes to writing for social copy is mm -hmm. it's essentially a conversation. So how do we just take this and turn it into a conversation on social? Well, yeah. And it, it's interesting because right now I'm in the middle of teaching a storytelling workshop. And one of the things that um, people don't get is that they think a story is needs to be this big, huge thing. But when you think about it, if you're building it correctly, each piece is like a chapter of the story. But also, I was showing them how short social posts could also be stories on their own that feed into the same context and whatever. And I don't know if you've ever heard of six word stories. Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. So I used a couple of six word stories just to give them the idea. I said, you could tell a story in as little as six words. Here are some examples, you know. And uh, probably the most famous one of those is attributed to Hemingway and it's for sale, baby shoes, never worn, you know, and you can go all kinds of directions with that. But the whole idea behind storytelling is creating that curiosity and helping people envision the story for themselves. And that's exactly what we want to do in this. I mean, think about this idea that buyers are saying we want to self-educate. We're going to self-serve. We don't need any stinking vendors involved in this. We're going to do it ourselves, you know, but what they actually don't know is what they don't know, right? So 
being a marketer today is so much fun because we get to tell the whole story and give them all that information that they need. And the vendor who does that the best is probably the one they're going to call and say, hey, okay, tell me more about how this works, you know, or whatever. But we have to help them envision our ideas and be able to visualize what does that mean? What do they mean? You know, what's that going to look like for me? And that's the value of being able to apply those storytelling or script writing kind of principles to the way we create marketing content. Exactly. Well, and that's interesting because that also brings up when we're talking about that buyer driven strategy Mm -hmm. of the content itself and that we need to focus that on the user Mm -hmm. and that the user is not always necessarily the buyer, you know, as you had even mentioned that the C-suite doesn't really care about your product until their team tells them that they need to. Well, right. They don't have time to go research it. So they're depending on their team to go do their due diligence and evaluate everything and get all that work done and then come back and make a recommendation. At that point, they'll look at it, you know. And so I call C-suite, you know, I kind of invented these layers of personas. So there's your primary persona, right, which is the one that you're going to engage from start to finish, more than likely. Then there's the what I call mini personas, which are like the influencers, but they only come in like during evaluation, think an IT team evaluating a piece of marketing technology or whatever to say to bless it and say, yep, it's got enough security. It will integrate with our systems. Okay, whatever. And then there are the what I call the tertiary personas, which are the ones that are the hardest to build because you're not probably not going to get interviews with them, the C-suite type people that are the ones that come in at the end and either bless it or say, heck no, we're not buying that. Well, for the many personas, what you need is content around what they care about when they come in to evaluate or whatever that role is, whatever kind of influencer they are. For the tertiary or the C-suite ones, you need a couple of good thought leadership pieces that create awareness, tell them, you know, you're good at what you do, (laughs) you know, and build some trust there that can be passed along to them by your primary persona. And so that was the other thing back at the beginning when you asked me, well, people have all these personas they want to build. Well, how reachable and engageable are they? Doesn't make any sense to spend the time and effort to build a full-blown persona and a full-blown content strategy if you can only engage them, you know, through pass-along content for a couple of things to just build some awareness and knowledge or for evaluation and not the rest of the store. You know what I mean? So I created these different level of personas, which amazingly enough, take different levels of effort, right? Much less effort to build an influencer persona or a tertiary persona than it would take to build a primary persona. So that expedites things, right? Because how many primary personas really do you have for a sale? And so, you know, there's been this this number that's been growing and Gartner keeps adding to it and whatever. Now it's up to, I've seen 25 people involved in a complex B2B purchase. And it's like, yeah, but, you know, there's probably two or three that are primary. Others are influencers. And yeah, if they say no, you're in trouble, which is why you have to do some work there, but not a full blown story, right? And then there's some that are going to be at the top for sign off, like now CFOs are sitting in more and, you know, whoever the other C-level people are that are, you know, need to bless it or what have you, but they don't need a whole boatload of content. So we need to be, you know, as marketers get asked to do more and more and more and more with less and less budget or whatever, we've got to get smarter about how we choose to allocate our resources And by building personas in the proper way, we can evaluate, okay, these personas need the full story. This persona, you know, maybe five assets will do the job for them. And this tertiary persona, maybe one or two, right? And so that changes the whole game. Instead of, okay, we've got 12 personas, we need to build 12 pieces of content for each one. And then there's social posts and blah, 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 you know, and it starts multiplying and just scares the heck out of everybody. (laughs) <laughs> well, and not everybody needs the same ebook. Not everybody's going to get the same information from the ebook. So, let's well, no, the context that. is different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. yep. And I, I've seen that often, where even we as marketers, we make the mistake when we're doing paid ads or even just some of our organic posts. We have this one particular piece of content, and we're going to try to write it and promote it to go to these five different types of personas, and we know it's not going to perform. Mm-mm. 
but or this cannot. is the piece that we have from our clients. And so now we're going to try to, you know, squeeze as much out of this lemon as we possibly can. Right. But there's just no way to win with that. No. It's, and it's, it's not the content's fault. You simply cannot write content that speaks to everyone. And right. the problem is if you try to do that, you get so high level that there's nothing in there that's relevant to anyone. Yeah. Right? yeah. Yeah. So that's what happens when you try to do that. Cause I've had clients try it too. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of like, you really don't want to do that. And here's why. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, if anything, well, the- at least engage one persona, mm-hmm. you know, yep. out of no, well, the- none. The one for many, mm-hmm. you know, especially when you're talking about your key content pieces, you just, you can't have the one for money. Mm-hmm. Got to focus. True. Well, that brings us to our, our last point, Ardith. Um, something that we were talking about earlier, just marketers being exhausted. You know, as as I use the example here, the lemon being squeezed too much. I think that's how all marketers are feeling right now. We're all being squeezed. We're being asked to do a lot with less than what we've had before. And we're just exhausted. Um, you know, aside from everything else. You had brought up a good point too, just seeing this lack of passion. Mm-hmm. And where have you seen the lack of passion and, and what have you been advising to these marketers to kind of help get them past this hump and maybe find that excitement about what we do and why we do it? Yeah, you know, a lot of us are tired. <laughs> it's been a long few years, but the problem I'm seeing because so much stuff is just getting put on our backs, you know, that we have to do. And, and I mean, I, I am old enough to remember when there wasn't social media demand gen, demand capture, demand, whatever, and performance marketing and growth marketing and social media and, you know, all of this stuff. And it, it's a lot. And I think by focusing in on your persona and really becoming curious about what can marketing do to actually drive this sale? Because let me tell you, in this environment and given the perspective of your buyers, it's not about generating a, ne- a name and then throwing it to sales and saying, here you go. You know, we've got to get them way farther through this process before they'll even talk to a salesperson. So we have to get that curiosity back. And I think the boundaries of the story, the buyer driven story and creating things that must drive that helps to narrow that scope because we're not just throwing stuff on channels or, you know, whatever to be everywhere and all of those things. If it doesn't fit our buyer and they don't hang out there, we're not going there. We don't have to create any more content for that. And so it helps us narrow our scope. But it also, in building the story, I think we get as, well, at least I do, I get as engaged in it as hopefully the buyers are, because I'm like, okay, if they read this, now what? How does their context shift, right? And so they're going to read it, and their takeaway is going to be something like this, and then they're going to say, oh, now I need to know about this other thing. So we got to go create that, and it all works together. And the fun part about it is when you can actually see it happen in your systems, right? And watch the engagement grow as they move through these things. And uh, for me, that's fascinating, but it doesn't happen when you're jumping all over the board to do all these, you know, like executive requests, like we need a new webinar for this and we need a new thing over here. And could you rewrite the product brochure? And oh, by the way, we need an ESG program. And could you do this other thing? You know, I mean, there it's so much, but I think, um, when you have personas and you have that bound the story that you're telling, at least around one solution, depending on how many you sell, it gives you also the facility to say no. Because the requests coming in don't serve that story. And so, you know, I'm in my storytelling workshop right now. I'm getting questions from the attendees about how do we convince our executives to let us buy us enough time. To, make, to show that this works before they start saying we want something new. And I started thinking about it and I thought, well, you don't have to tell them that you're stuck on this storyline and whatever. What you say is, well, this month we're producing a new webinar. It's a piece that fits into your story, but you don't have to explain all that to them. They want something new. Great. Next month we're writing, we're putting out a new ebook. It's also part of the storyline, but Hey, it's new, you know, And so there's ways that we can address these questions in service to maintaining the integrity of that story 
rather than just trying to knee jerk react to what's new for this month. What are you doing new for us? You know, we're bored with this old thing. Give us something new. Well, you are going to have new things, right? Because the story keeps going on across all of this. So it just depends in the way you decide to present what you're doing to your executive team or what have you. But the other thing that I know is um, I read the, the most fascinating research report and it was a small study. It was done over in the UK and there were 175 people, 75 were CMOs. The other hundred were all C-level. So CEO, CFO, COO, whatever, all the C-level and five different C-level titles. <laughs> and here's the gist though. 1% of these people said that B2B marketing offers a meaningful interpretation of the human experience. 1%. That should scare the heck out of us. And, you know, it's, there were a lot of other interesting findings, but that one just kind of set me back and it was like, whoa, you know, why are we not doing this? And it's, yeah. So I, I just, I get so excited about it because I love, you know, really figuring this out and wrestling it to the ground. And most of my clients have long sales cycles and they're selling really complex things. And it takes some information exchange, you know, and transfer to, to help people gain the knowledge they need and the, to get confidence enough to buy. And so we can tell these really in-depth, fun stories, you know, and I, uh, so I always think there's something exciting to learn about and tell, but I think what re-stimulates curiosity and engagement and all of that is having conversations with your customers and really figuring out what makes them tick and, you know, why they're your customer and what that looked like. And as well as how do we keep them as our customers? Because yeah, that's a whole different story, right? I feel like we could do like a whole other podcast on, on the retention piece of that too. Well, you can because it's a whole different status quo, right? They've already solved the original problem. So now what, right? How do you look at that story? It starts from a different place. So, but I, you know, somehow we have to be able to rein in all this stuff that's being piled on us. Yeah. And I think, you know, really using story uh, personas and stories as a foundation allows us to create boundaries around what what we should do and what we can say no to. I like having that structure and giving them something to kind of structuralize as well and saying mm -hmm. we have this and here's how we build it out from this. Right. As opposed to your earlier example of, okay, we did this, we did three things with it, it didn't work, and we're going to move on. Mm -hmm. Which I think we've all been in that position where we've got the CEO, the CMO, whomever saying, okay, well, we did that for two months and we didn't get anything. So now we've got to move on from it and not allowing us the time to adapt. So once you're right. And I think that's the other thing too, because we don't know enough about our audiences, we can put something in market for two months and say, well, that didn't work. Let's do something different instead of saying, let's optimize it. What right. can we tweak to make it better? Instead, we just go, okay, throw it away. Let's do yep. something else. And then we start over again and we haven't learned anything. Right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, Ardith, thank you so much for joining me today. I think that there's some great nuggets of wisdom that our audiences will get from here. And I'm excited to, uh, to see what everybody comes back with. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's always a fun conversation.